Bible. Let me read it again. Jeremiah 5, 20 and 22. Announce this to the descendants of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah. Hear this, you foolish and senseless people. You who have eyes but do not see. You who have ears but do not hear. Should you not fear me, declares the Lord. Should you not tremble in my presence. I made the sand a boundary for the sea. An everlasting barrier it cannot cross. The waves may roll, but they cannot prevail. They may roar, but they cannot cross it. Let me take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Deacon Marcus, go ahead and leave the, 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 the track rolling just lightly. I want to stay in an attitude of worship, an attitude of praise. Attitude of receptivity in the things of God and the word of God. We are in a series right now for the month on what? The presence of God or God's presence. Last week, we dealt with God's abiding presence. How God will go with us. He says, and I will go with you. What does that mean? It means he's going to walk. He's going to journey. He's going to travel with us. And wherever we go, we will receive what? Rest. That was last week. Abiding presence. And so this week... <clears throat> God said, I want you to begin to deal with the power of my presence, the glory of my presence, the holiness of my presence. And so I was reading through the word, I was scouring through the concordance and through all of the nuances of the holiness of God or the presence of God and, and the, 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 the greatness of God's presence in his people and in their midst and in our lives. And I came to Jeremiah 5 and God said, stop. Don't you love when God says, stop? You know, sometimes the instructions from God are some of the most beautiful things that we could ever hear in our life. And God said, I want you to stop right there. That's exactly what it is that I want you to preach on, on Sunday. I said, okay, God. So I began to study through and I began to scour through and deal with everything that as best I could that it meant. And I compose this message together, and I know that I know that I know that I will not be able to deliver this message in its fullness the way I wrote everything out. But I'm not worried about all of the time and all of the exercise of my mind it took. The only thing I'm worried about is God being pleased and God being here. And so we find ourselves in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 20 through 22, and God poses a question. He says, should you not fear me? Should you not tremble in my presence? Why would God ask this question? What was the preface? What was the introduction to it all? Why was God having a conversation with Jeremiah about this? Well, the answer is this. God Almighty was watching Israel move to and fro. God Almighty was watching Israel move and travel and live their life generation after generation after generation after generation past the time of Moses, past the time of Joshua, past the time of the era of them moving into the promised land, past the time of the judges, Saul and David and Solomon. And here we find ourselves after that in the era of what's called the time of the prophets. By this time, the northern kingdom of Israel had lost all of their kings. And we find the southern kingdom, Judah, really at the end of an era of all of the kings of Judah. And as each king took over, you might have had one out of five where the Bible says, and they did right in the eyes of the Lord. All the rest of them, bad, horrible. Stench in the nostrils of God. And as the kingdom goes, and as the throne goes, and as the palace goes, so do the people. And so these kings who brought in idol worship, and as they brought in the avoidance of the reality and the presence of God, so did the people in Judah begin to worship other idols and, and um, sacrifice themselves to other idols. And they made those things primary. And God comes to the place in the time frame of Jeremiah, six, some 612 years before Jesus, and he says this, he says, that's it, I'm done with these people, I'm done speaking to them, they didn't listen to my servants, they didn't listen to my leaders. They didn't listen to my prophets. They saw everything that Elijah did and Elisha did and they ignored it all. And now here we are and they're still doing the same thing. 
They're still worshiping idols. They're still sacrificing their children to Molech. They're still burning their children in the fire. Their focus is not me. Their priority is not me. It's other gods. It's gods of wood. It's gods of stone. Gods that don't hear. Gods that don't see. And I'm about done with it. And God says, I'm going to send a nation to come in. They're going to be a nation that do not speak your language. You have nothing in common. And they will be in that season more powerful than you. And I'm going to send them to take all of the residents and inhabitants of Judah. And I'm going to pull them out. And I'm going to send them to Babylon. That's when we move into the era of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, and Obadiah. Oh, that's, that, that's the era that God is talking about through Jeremiah. And God says, I'm going to send all of them out of here because I can't stand to see them in the land that I gave them. Understand this, that when God gives you something, when God gives you a land, when God gives you a property, when God gives you a blessing to live in, he expects still to be number one. He expects still to be the focus. He expects still to be the one that your attention is focused upon and nothing else. And God says, when I give you a blessing, I need to make sure and I need you to make sure that I stay primary and the focus of everything that's in your life right now. And unfortunately, Israel failed and Judah failed to do that. It is, you know, the praisers, Judah, Judah means praise. The praisers failed to do that. And God said, I'm moving them out. I'm taking them out and they're going to be in slavery now. And the gods that they served here, the gods that they worshiped here, now they're going to be servants to someone else in that new land. And God says this after saying all of that. Then he says to Jeremiah this, and it's our text for today. What does he say? Verse 22. Should you, Judah, not fear me, declares the Lord. Should you not tremble in my presence? God is saying this. He's saying, I have the power, the right, and the authority to take you, to take where you are, to take your entirety of your inhabitants right now, and to transport you from where you are into a place that you've never seen before. I have the capability, I have the authority to do all of these things because I'm God. God says, I hold all power in my hand. I hold all might in my hand. I hold everything that I need in my hand, in my palm to do whatever it is that I want to do. And whenever I've decided to do something, that's it. And nothing else can change my mind. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a God that does not change, nor is he a son of man that he should repent or what? Change his mind. So when God stands in a place and stands in a position of making a decision, his will is forever known in the in the heavens and on the earth and what he said and declared shall come to pass and he said so now I'm going to take Judah out of here and I'm going to transport them and they need to come to the place of understanding the reality of my power the reality of my might the reality of my glory and everything that I am and everything that I possess in my spiritual muscle that I possess for myself and after establishing himself, then he poses the question and says, should you not fear me? Should you not tremble in my presence? Then he gives reasons why they should. He, he says this, he said, here's some of the things that I, that I do. Here's some of the, the things that I engage in. God says, I made the sand a boundary for the sea so that it's uncrossable. In essence, he's saying, I'm the God of creation. I'm the God who's responsible for it all. I keep everything in order. 
He says, God says this. He said, also Jeremiah. He said, I am the God who gives autumn and spring rain in seasons. What does that mean? He's the God that brings timely refreshment on the earth whenever it needs it. So whenever the earth becomes, becomes dry and there's a little drought in the land, he says, okay, now it's time for the spring rain. Now it's time for the spring, for the autumn rain. I'm going to give refreshment to the earth so that harvest might come forth and that people might eat again. I'm responsible for your sustenance. And he assures them of the regular weeks of the harvest. I'm responsible for everything that you eat. I'm responsible for your produce. I'm responsible for your food. I'm responsible for everything that you're going to put in your mouth so you can stay alive to do exactly what it is that I've called you to do. Sometimes we ask God, God, why are you giving me this blessing? God, why is it that, that you could constantly and consistently uh, enable me to have food on my table and clothes on my back and a drink on my table? Why? God says, because I got to keep you alive because I got an assignment on your life. And God stands in a place and in a position in the presence of Jeremiah and he says, I am that God. I am that God who's responsible. I am that God who's the orchestrator. I am that God who's the architect of the ages. And everything that I create and everything that I make is under my supervision. Remember, last week, he has the supervisory agent of the eye of the ages. He's the one that stands in a position of being responsible for everything that he's made and everything that he created. And he says, now that, I, that, now that you understand that I live in that space, that I am that God, now I have the question for you, Jeremiah. And I got the question for Judah. Should you not fear me? Should you not fear me and stand in awe of my person and my power and my might? And then he couples the question by saying this. And should you not tremble in my presence? Literally translated, should you not writhe in agony in my face? When you come face to face with me, God says, should you not understand that the only action that you can take is to tremble and to writhe in front of me? That word tremble there is the Hebrew word heil, H-I-Y-L. And as I just said, it literally means to writhe in his presence, to writhe in anguish. When you come to the place and when we come to the place in our life, when we realize and we understand that he is God and we are not, then we move into the right understanding and position in our life. When we understand that we are but dust and he is the originator of that dust, then we move into the right space. When we realize that without his wind that, that blew into the nostrils of, of Adam and man became a living soul, when we realize that, then we move into the right place. When we move into the confine and the reality of understanding that he's God and we're not, that he's powerful and we're not, that we could be singed to a crisp if, if when we walk into his presence that he could move us to nothing. The moment we walk into his presence, when we get there, then he says, and now you You've moved into the right space and the right place with me and that's all I'm waiting for and that's all I'm asking for yes, Lord. and God wants you and you and you and you and you who are watching and me myself to come to the place in our life where we understand and we realize that we are absolutely nothing without him and by one evacuation of the wind that lives with us we will fall to the ground dead and void of life the moment he withdraws the blessing we have nothing to give this world we will sit like a formless and lifeless corpse on a chair when God or if God ever removed his life from us and God says to you and he says to me if you can simply come to the place of understanding my might my brilliance my power my authority my might my glory my existence in your life then you will move into the place that I want you to move into and so there is an opportunity there's an option to stand on either side of the line to say, God, I realize you're holy. God, I realize you're mighty and I'm nothing without you. 
or to walk on the other side of the line and say, God, yes, I, I know you're God. Yes, I know you're holy. Yes, I know you're mighty. Yes, I know you're great. Yes, I know you're powerful. But the reality is, I'm still going to stand erect in your presence. And I'm going to maintain, I'm going to withhold my humanity and my understanding of who I am, regardless whether or not you're standing in front of me. And if and when you get there, that is a very, very scary place to be. Because when you step into that arena, then you are telling God that he does not have control over your life anymore. That you are the master of your destiny. You're the captain of your own vessel. And that you will steer that rudder wherever, however, and whenever you want. And God says, here's what you need to understand. Here's what you need to realize, you finite human being that I created. That I am God. And you are not. And that I am in control. And you are not. And by one blast of my nostril, I can send you from San Bruno, California, all the way to Tokyo, Japan, so you can watch the Olympics in person without a passport. That's how powerful he is. And if he can transport Philip from where he was in the New Testament, and send him by a creek to witness to an Ethiopian eunuch and baptize him. He can move anybody he wants to. Jesus said this, and I'm done. Jesus said this in, in, a, in, a, in, in the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 11. He said, he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Let me say it again. Now this, is, this isn't Pastor Santino, this isn't even Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Jesus said, he who humbles himself will be, not maybe, not could be, not maybe tomorrow, he will be exalted there is a promotion in your position when you and I get to the place in our life where our position in God is to be humble then your promotion in him is coming and God says, all I'm waiting on is a group of people. All I'm waiting on is a person to come to the place in their life where they see me as number one. They see everything else under me. I become the focus. I become what's primary. I become everything that they have their eyes set upon. And they realize and they recognize that without me, they are nothing. And when we get there, and when we realize the holiness of God and the holy presence of God, then God says, then I'm gonna move you. Then I'm gonna exalt you. Then I'm gonna lift you up. Then I'm gonna give you a promotion in the spirit and the things that are material. Then I'm gonna move you from the place of where you are into the next dimension of your life. I'm gonna say this story, we're gonna pray and then God's gonna move. I was speaking to, to Margo, my cousin, about three weeks ago. And we were talking about things of the kingdom and things of the ministry and things of the church. And I told her this. I said, she asked me, she said, she said, she said she, you know, she, she didn't call me Pastor Sam. You know, she, 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 she said, she goes, Sam. I said, I'm drinking myself. Yeah. She said, 
What do you want? Now, now you know that's a loaded question to ask me. Because, you know, I want a Corvette and I want a Ferrari and, you know, I want a butler and I want a cook and a nutritionist and a fitness instructor and, and, and a nice house. And, you know, what, she said, what do you want? And I knew that she was talking about the things of God, the things of the kingdom, the things of the church, the things of the ministry. And I said, here's what I want, Margo. I said, I want a manifestation of the glory of God in this house, the likes of which we've never heard, the likes of which we've never seen, the likes of which we've never put our eyes upon, the likes of which we've never smelled with our, with our senses. And I told her, I said, because here's why, and here's why I can say this, because God, yes, is a God that, that does not change, but in the confine of his not changing and in the, and in the, the, the permanency of his nature, He's still moving in another dimension so he doesn't change by the fact that he's still moving. So his movement never stops and so that piece of it does not change. I said, so Largo, what does that tell us? I said, it tells us that God has something to do. That everything that he's done in the past 30 years in this ministry, everything he's done in the past 30 years in this church has been absolutely phenomenal. It's been absolutely wonderful. It's been absolutely glorious. And it's been absolutely beautiful. And it's been all God. And I said, but remember this and think about it this way. Where Genesis Worship Center was in 1990 was not where it was in 1995. And where it was in 1995 was not where it was in 2000. And if you keep moving through the timeline of the ministry, you still saw the glory and the power of God increasing greater and greater and greater and greater. It wasn't just a song and a powerful message. Then the healing started and the deliverance took over and then the prophetic started and our founder and our pastor moved into an apostolic office in this house where he destroyed error and he set in place truth that can be built upon. There is always something new in God. And there is always a new dimension in God. And the reason why you see churches stale, and the reason why you see churches fail, and the reason why you see churches full that were once hot and once were glorious with the presence of God was because they got to a place, and I told Margo this, I said they got to a place where they said, okay, God, we've seen some great things with you, but that's all we're going to allow you to do. We've seen a lot, but we're not going to allow this to go any further because we don't know if it's God or if it's you. And they themselves, and in the mental reasoning of their humanity, told God that's it that's enough and what you saw them do 50 years ago and 30 years ago is the same thing that they're doing today I came by to tell somebody this that my God says I don't change I'm a God who changes times and seasons I change times and seasons I change times and seasons and everything I did in the Old Testament I superseded it by sending my son and he brought a new dimension of the kingdom of God on the earth and I came by this morning to tell you and you and you and everybody watching God is going to do a new thing in this place everyone standing everyone standing everyone standing Facebook Live, lift your hands right now. If you're on your couch, in your car, at the office, at the beach, I don't care what you got in your hand right now. Wherever you're watching me, 
Lift your hands right now. God is in this house. God is in this place. I've preached, I've prayed, we've worshiped and we've praised. And now God is waiting upon you to move yourself into a new dimension with Him. To come to a place where you will be exalted in His presence. like we did before but this time it's different and I want you to cry out to God and I want you to tell him that he's holy I want you to tell him that he's marvelous I want you to tell him that he can do anything that he wants in this place and in this house and in your life and the moment he begins to move in your life then he's going to begin to move in this house in a different way how do you think that all of the revival started it came because people got to a place that they were hungry and they were thirsty after God. How do you think Azusa busted loose? Because people said, I want nothing else but you. I want no one else but you. I'm not concerned about my job. I'm not concerned about anything else. The only thing that I want to do is to get out of my place of work and to move on to Bonnie Bray Street and to move into the glory and the confines of the manifestation of the anointing of God. And it got so large and it got so big that fire was on the rooftop and they had to call the Los Angeles Fire Department and come and see what was going on. It got so powerful. It got so great that people would walk on the sidewalk and they would be hit by the glory. A simple pedestrian would be hit by the glory of God and would fall out on the sidewalk. The great revival of Azusa, the great revival of in Wales in the early 1900s where men and women were set on fire by God and God changed and, and totally uh, turn that, that place upside down to where the bars closed and the nightclubs closed and all of those things took place and the animals didn't even understand the, the, the language of their owners anymore because they weren't even cussing anymore. That's revival. And on the day of Pentecost where the 120 were in the upper room and Jesus said, go wait in Jerry for the gift. And they weren't concerned about anything else but him. They weren't concerned with anything else but his spirit and his presence. And for 50 days they waited for him. We've been waiting for 30 years for the next, another move of the spirit in this place. And what our great founder and leader saw in the spirit was what would come in this next phase. And he told me time and time again, he said, Santino, son, I can see it but I won't be there for it. And it would break my heart in two to hear him say that to me. And when he would look me in the eye and tell me of everything that God was gonna do with this place and in this church and to know and to realize that he would not be there for it, it would break me inside. But sometimes the breaking releases the next phase. There must come one in order for the next one to come. And everything that God instituted and everything that God has willed in the past 30 years and for the next 30 years will come to pass in this place.
Lift your hands in this house. Father, I worship you. Father, I glorify you. Father, I honor you. I love you. I praise your name. I magnify your name. I lift you up in this house. I release your will in this place. I release your will in this church. I release your will in this ministry. And everything that you've orchestrated and everything that you've ordained and everything that you've already written, God, I ask that you will activate what you've put down with the pen of eternity on the parchment of eternity and have it manifest in our midst and in our lives. God, I ask that you will do it now. I ask that these would be a people of power. I ask that they would be a people of glory. I ask that they would be a people of might, that they would be a people of manifestation and the same power that hit the upper room and the same power that hit Azusa and the same power that hit the Welsh Revival will hit these people and they will know and understand and realize that they are people that are indwelled with the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost in their life. And so I speak it in the name of Jesus. Now! I speak the wind of the Spirit in this place. I speak a new wind. I speak a new anointing. I speak a new phase. I speak a new era. I speak a new demonstration in this house. I speak a new fire on the inside of your belly. I speak a new fire on the inside of your heart. I speak the next phase of the will of God in your life to understand and to realize that he's God and we're not. That he's powerful and in, within him we're nothing. But all we can do is live in the confine of his will for our life. And in his confine and in his will and in his heart is grace and might and mercy and power and glory and anointing and Pentecost and signs and wonders and miracles. I speak it to you. I speak the activation of it now in the name of Jesus. How many of you want to see a new glory of God in this place? How many of you want to see a new glory manifestation of God in this church and in this house? How many want to move from where we are to where we're going in the things of God? If that's your want you to shoot your hand up as high as you can get it. And God's going to begin to set you on fire. He's going to begin to ignite your soul, ignite your spirit, ignite your mind, ignite your heart by the person of his spirit in your life. I release it now. I release the glory of God in this place. I release the power of God in this place. I release the might of God in this house to do whatever it is that he wants to do. However he wants to do it, whenever he wants to do it. Let me tell you something, and let me tell you very clear and very succinctly. If God wants to have a service in this place on a Friday night or a Sunday morning or a Sunday night, and that thing lasts two, three, four, five hours, then God says, if I'm going to do it for you, I expect you to be here. I don't expect you to take off early. I don't expect you to put me on a time frame and on a time clock. God is not concerned with your watch and he's not concerned with your time. Pastor Santino, how can you say that? Because in heaven there is no time. It simply moves dimensions and seasons. As they move in the continuity of everything that's holy and divine up there. And that's why Jesus said, May it be on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm looking for some people this morning who will say, God, whatever's going on up there, that's what I want down here. That's what I want in my life. That's what I want in my heart. That's what I want in my body. That's what I want in my soul. That's what I want in my church. That's what I want in this ministry. That's what I want in this city, in this town, and in this state, and in this country. Whatever's going on up there, I want it down here. Shoot your hands up one more time, Father. I thank you 
I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you do. I thank you that you do all things well. I thank you that you are the God of Pentecost. God, I ask that supernatural power, supernatural might might invade this place. That it might invade your people. That it might invade me. And that when people come into this house, they will know and they'll realize that it's not just a simple, ordinary service where we come in and we sing a couple songs and we hear a nice message and we leave and we go on about our day, but that there is a manifestation and a presence of God Almighty by His Spirit that cannot be manufactured, that, not, that cannot be created, and it's so real, it's undeniable. And may there be a special thirst and a hunger on the inside of each person as they're touched by your presence, and may they thirst for more and hunger for more until the day that you call them home. God, that's what we ask for. God, that's what we're seeking for. God Almighty, that's what, we, that's what we're petitioning you for. God, do exactly what it is that you want to do. Do exactly what it is that you've already willed this place to be and this church to be. Do it by your spirit in the name of Jesus. This ground is yours. This platform is yours. This floor is yours. All of these chairs are yours. The drums are yours. The piano is yours. The musicians are yours. The ushers are yours. The cameramen are yours. The sound man is yours. Everything that goes on in this place and this ministry is yours. So set it on fire by your spirit. Set it on glory by your spirit. And may people all around the world know and realize that you are the God in Israel and you live in this house to change their life. Do it by your spirit. Do it by your might. Do it by your glory. Do it by your power. In the name of Jesus. Supernaturally ignite us and empower us and fill us by you to become the people that you've called us to be. In the name of Jesus. I ask you for it. We ask you for it. In Jesus' name. We give you glory now. We give you glory now. If you have to go, you may leave. If you have to go, you may leave. But I feel that God wants us to be here just a little bit more. I said it before I was started preaching. God wants to be here, us to be here a little bit more. If you have to go, go ahead. It's totally fine. I need some people who are willing to intercede right now. I need some people who are willing to begin to pray even now. I need some people who are, who are going to cry out and call out to God in a new way who want to see a new dimension, a new manifestation of God in this place and in this church, who want to see God do something absolutely brand new to break the box of what we've known, to add upon where we've been, and to take us into a new territory in Him. I need some people to begin to pray right now, not just the people in the front, but the people in the middle and the people in the back. If that's you, I need you to open your mouth and cry out to God. I need you to open your mouth and call out to God. God's going to do it. God's gonna, God never tells you to pray for something without the intent of answering. I need you to open your mouth and cry out to God right now. And he's beginning to move. He's going to be in a touch. He's going to be in a heal. He's going to be to turn this ministry around and move us to the next phase and dimension of his, of his will in our life. How many of you want it? If that's you, begin to cry out to God even now and he will do it in our midst with our very own eyes we'll see it If you want it, tell him that you want it so bad. 
that you want to see what's next. You want to see what's in his will. You want to see what's in his mind. You want to see what he has planned for this place and this town and this state and this country. Tell him you want to see it in the midst of turmoil. Tell him you want to see it in the midst of worldwide sickness. Tell him you want to see it in the midst of seemingly everything falling apart. Tell him that you want to see it and he will hear you. We want it. We want the glory. We want your might. We want the power. We want the might. We want everything that's of you and nothing less. So that we walk into this place, you're already here. When we walk into this place, you're already moving. When we walk into this place, you're already touching and healing and delivering and setting free and opening minds and opening understandings of people. God, we ask that you will do it in a new way and in a mighty way and the things that you've done in other churches and the things that you've done in other ministries that are orchestrated and designed of you God we ask for the same thing the same spirit the same wind the same glory the same outworkings of your spirit we ask for it now in the name of Jesus. We we'll praise you for it now. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. Move into the next dimension of your will for this place. Move to the next phase of your will for this house. By the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Everyone shoot your hands up. Father, we ask that you do it now. We ask that you start the work now by the power of your spirit. May it be a button that is pressed in the heavens that does not have a stop to it. But may it be everything that you want it to be. And every will of yours may it come to pass by the will and the grace and the power of your spirit. And we will jump on board and we will jump on that train as you press that green button that says go. And we will not stop you. We will not question you. We will not halt you or hinder you. But we will tell you that we will be with whatever it is that you want to be with. And we're with you by your spirit. Give these people a mind to perceive, a heart to believe. A spirit that's receptive to your work, your word, and your word. In your holy and your mighty name. We thank you. We call it done. We call it sudden. In the name of Jesus. By the power of God. By the glory of God. By the working of the Spirit of God. In this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Everybody stand to your feet in this house. to yourself to do and to be everything that you've called us to do and be in the name of Jesus and so may God's grace and presence and might and power go with you as he rests upon you and rests among you and in your life and in your home and in your family and in your body and may you know his presence in a new way in Jesus name God bless you we'll see you Wednesday